push it real good. Is that salt and pepper? Is it? Yeah. Who is it? See? You're a man of many cultures. Just of something. <laughs> yeah, we're apparently people of pestilence, too. It In, got us last week. There was probably a bet on if you're going to say pestilence. I don't care. Because every time we miss a week, <laughs> yeah. pestilence comes well, out. It's a nice word because it describes a lot of stuff. I still don't know what it means. You should probably look it up. Well, I I'm going to keep using it then. I feel like it's an insult to me. How do me. you not know what pestilence means? Because it sounds different than what I think it is. What does it sound like to you? Uh, what do you a think it shit. is? What do you think it is? Think what, like what I actually... No, that's yes. petulant. Mm. And what are we saying? Pestulance. You just spit all over me. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> I had to emphasize. Yeah. <laughs> well, same, same. How about that? I like it. Um, missed a week. I apologize. This time it was my fault. I got the AIDS and the monkey pox and everything in between. Bill. That falls under Sorry. pestilence. The which falls under pestilence. Yes. Are you allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> probably not. We're probably not allowed to say after shit we say. <laughs> Hello. Mm-hmm. But we're back and we got a bunch of questions that have come in. Yes. We're going to try to get through a few of those. We also had some people ask about what about purple belt because yes. we about blue belt, like what we would expect mm. out of a blue belt and then what we'd expect out of a black belt. At least a couple things, not the whole thing. Uh, so some people are like, well, what about purple belt? You big sloppy fa- fatties. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> Holy cow, you rescued yourself. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm an ally and a friend, trust me. An ally. Oh my God. So <laughs> I just want to punch you in the throat for wow. saying that word. It almost got out. Like, okay. okay. Anyways, let's move on. So we're going to start right away All right. with a YouTube comment that came in. Oh, my favorite. Yes, it is. It, it's a nice comment. Okay, I, cool. I, I haven't even read it, actually. <laughs> oh, jeez. So it says uh, from old Jake, not our Jake. Uh huh. Um, State Farm? Yes. Okay. Potentially. Pleated pants. Nice. He says, nice. Good. Uh, be good to hear what you guys think. Also, I've got a bit of a weird question. Maybe he asked another question. He's responding or something. Um, he says, it's just been going through my thoughts recently. I train more gi than no gi. Probably about a 60-40 split. Due to no gi being later, the later session in the day, sometimes... Uh, I'm smoked from the first session. So he's doing a gi session and then right back to back doing a no gi session. Oof. And he's saying sometimes he's smoked from the first one. Understandable. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you think a coach sees this in terms of belts? Because I'm probably more proficient technically in the gi and a little behind in no gi. Would you need to be a purple belt level at both gi and no gi in order to be promoted. So I, I, I'm just assuming because he said purple belt that he's a blue belt and he's wondering like to get to purple belt, is his coach going to evaluate and be like, all right, his no gi game's got to be purple belt level and his gi game. And let's just not limit it to that. Like that could be whether you're a purple belt looking to brown, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. But it, I think the answer that both of us are going to have is going to be applicable to all those belts. <laughs> Correct. But why don't you kick that off? So first of all, it depends on your coach and your academy's focus. True. Okay. If you're a 10th planet system, you know, they're pretty much no gi. They all are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the context matters. For instance, um, I think, I think the best way to look at it is go look at back at like Jean-Jacques Machado's game Mm -hmm. because of a physical limitation he has with his hand. He has very, not much of a difference between his gi and no gi game. The fundamentals are the same, right? Of course, grips come into play with gi, Mm -hmm. but when you say no gi level, what do you mean? I mean, do you mean the stuff that is unique to no gi like heel hooks Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of the fundamentals are the same. It's just that you're doing things without grips. And for me as a, you know, and I'd be a hypocrite if I said any differently because I barely train no gi, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, 
And a lot of that has to just do with the amount of time I can train and the choices I can make. In our gym schedule. In our gym schedule and all that. But um, no, I, I don't think so at all. I think if you show good fundamental jujitsu at purple at blue belt level, which oh by the way, we're going to talk about mm-hmm. what kind of things we would expect that should translate into gi or no gi. If you're talking about a specific thing that's unique to no gi, um, like you know we don't we don't heel hook and a lot of the leg attacks we can do with reaping, you know no mm-hmm. gi that we can't do in gi. Mm-hmm. That is a little different skill set, but in sure. general, I don't think you should be judged one way or another. Like, that. I, I, in other words, if you feel like you're lack, quote unquote, lacking in nogi, in my mind, if you show strong fundamentals that I would expect of a purple belt, yeah, I don't see how that would impact my decision to promote you. Right. Yeah. The and we are like Chris said, we're going to talk about what our expectations for a purple belt is yeah. in a little bit, but in this guy's scenario. So I'm, I train more no gi than you, mm-hmm. but I still train less no gi than gi by far. Mm-hmm. Um, there has been times where I was actually more of a no gi person. I my first gym I started at was a Ten Planet gym in Phoenix, where I did a, a little short period there, um, like literally a couple months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I it's something you're gonna notice when promotions are starting to come. Let's say you're that blue belt, just staying on his example there, and you get your purple belt. The day before you were a blue belt, now you're a purple belt, okay? you In that time, when you're that blue belt that's right there at, ready to get his purple, you're, you might have a purple belt level knee cut. You might have a brown belt level um spider sweep like a balloon sweep or something like that like you there's going to be certain parts of your game that are undoubtedly the next level and sometimes even higher um i feel like olivia has a really high level knee cut i feel like it's basically like a black belt level like her her timing her grip structure stuff like that there's this little thing that she has that is it it feels like i have to respect it Otherwise, she's going to get it. But there's going to be some things that are very much a blue belt level still. Or even less. Like stuff that you've kind of neglected. Um, let's say your your game right now as, as a blue belt is you, you got, you, you play spider guard. You got a decent lasso game. Um, and you, you like butterfly. Well... Most likely, your close guard game sucks. My close guard game sucks. I have blue belt level close guard. Close guard. Now, that's because I've neglected it. I play all these other guards that are mm, a little bit more movement, dynamic base. I think they feed your attributes. Yes, I thought you were going to say ego. No, <laughs> your attributes that you have, your yeah. your your mobility. And yes, your, yeah. There's certain things that your kind open of guard push me towards that mm-hmm. open guard. Like so, I you I'm known as kind of being the more I have flexible hips. Mm-hmm. So in close guard, it's I mean Mika Gaval shows that if you have flexible hips, you can have a lethal close guard. Mm-hmm. But um, I haven't explored that yet. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I utilize that stuff for these other things now. It's kind of like when they say a lanky guy should play spider guard because he's got lanky legs, which I don't necessarily agree with, but um, it, it's an easy default. So anyways, getting, getting off track. So y- your nogi won't, y- your whole game, whether it's nogi or gi, will not be purple belt level. You will have certain aspects that are purple belt level, and your coach most likely knows this and thinks this as well. The thing is, we want the, the whole... <clears throat> the average to be right there. Now that once again, that doesn't even mean literally the week before you were a blue belt, right? That doesn't mean you are, unless you have a coach that maybe slow promotes, right? This, this can happen. And typically even those coaches that, that promote a little slower, they will, they will treat people individually. 
So you'll, and we kind of talked about this, I think, with the black belt thing, right? There's going to be certain people, whether it's age or physical limitations or even aspirations. If you're someone that wants to compete, they're going to treat you a little more stringent. If, if you've put out there like, hey, I want to compete, I want to be a coach, right? Your, your coach is probably going to have a little bit higher standard than the person that's there for fitness, camaraderie, and just martial arts. So the answer is no. You, you, your coach most likely realizes that you do one more than the other. Um, there's going to be certain things, though, that let's say to get your purple belt that your coach is going to want to see from like on the nogi perspective, as in depending on, as you said, where's your coach lie on leg locks and stuff. So we're, we teach insights in Gaku and like all that kind of stuff. If you're a white belt, a blue belt, whatever, now we preface certain things with like control and all that, uh, legality within tournaments, but we're teaching it. So if you're at a school that has doesn't even touch that stuff till brown, like the kind of traditional way, I guess you could say, uh, then you're going to want to know what your coach thinks of that. Because if he's traditional, he's not going to, he doesn't care that you know insights in kaku or or something like that those kind of leg lock positions that are typical in the in noki but if he's a little bit more progressive or forward thinking then he might want you to have knowledge of the knee bar of a toe hold or even escapes 50 50 You'll kind of know that though before the hand. Like if you're a <clears throat> if you're a purple belt, you kind of know your academy's expectations. Like you'll yeah. be training brown belt IBJJF legal stuff at purple belt for sure. Yes, and if you're at a school that doesn't, like I'm not saying leave or anything, but that's you're putting you at a disadvantage on your own time. Study that stuff. Yeah, have your favorite training partners that are. Black, brown, purple, whatever, blue, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. if you have a blue belt that's your training partner, that's like a trusted training partner, and you know they don't rip when they get into a, a, a sub or something like that. Start working that mm -hmm. stuff on, on your guys on the side or something on on your own. Like, not saying not outside the gym, unless your coach is like a super Nazi. But well, well so your answer was no, then right? Right. The longest no. It's funny. It's funny because I was like a paragraph. And it said the same thing. You were two sentences. Yeah. I was I, three pages. Yeah. And we both said no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to convey that like <laughs> yeah, you yeah. will, you're, when you get promoted, your, your whole game will never be what that next belt is. No. Whether that's black or, or whatever. Like it, it's, it's really once you start getting to the next belt that you have everything is at that level mm -hmm. for the most part. Like I said, I, my close guard is still freaking horrific. It's people make fun of me. I cry in the shower. <laughs> it's bad. But for the most part, once you start getting to that next belt, everything is now at least average at, at a minimum at your previous belt. Yeah. That's so, a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. You know what? It was a good question. Yeah, I like it. Made you talk a lot. <laughs> That's what the people want, you know? My mom <laughs> listens. Um, okay, so now we got a grip question. Our, our friend here, Brian, has uh, talked about his grips before, and so people might recognize a question. But so it, it, it previously he talked about his grips burnout uh, fairly quickly. Now, he went to his doctor, and he had a little conversation, so... We'll watch, hopefully Brian's watching the podcast and can see your face. But uh, so he says, so lately my grips are only lasting two rolls, sometimes three. I stretch them, I massage them, and maybe I can get another roll out of them, but it just doesn't happen. He says, I'm a purple belt, so he's a lot of experience. And he says, before you say something, you snarky little bastard. He says, <laughs> I added that part. He says, and no, I don't hold on for dear life with my grips. You old, <laughs> old man. I don't know where he's getting that from. <laughs> remembering a podcast. He says, I'm remembering a podcast episode where Dr. Chris stated that poor grips can signify a sign of poor aging. Hearing this, I went to my doctor 
and he said that I need to stop listening to podcasts, <laughs> specifically <laughs> ours. And then he had my uh, he had me grab his hands, and he felt that I can grab them and what grabbed them well and said I was fine and normal. So very scientific test. <laughs> but he says, but my grips didn't use to give out like this. It's been getting worse over the last six months. Any recommendations, whether it's PT, is this a sign of something more serious? Does he have AIDS? Should I be concerned? Did he ask about the AIDS? He did not ask about AIDS, but I'm putting <laughs> it out there. Yeah. You, Should he be concerned? Your input is greatly appreciated. So really good question. First of all, you, you quoted me correctly <laughs> saying that grip strength has been correlated with all cause mortality. So if you test a hundred old people, the ones with the greater grip strength generally are going to live longer. Mm -hmm. That's all I said. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be very restrained right now because I feel like and I'm sure I can just picture this doctor that you were talking to, too. See, there's some little spindly little freaking. If he was on a baseball team, did he play catcher? No, he wouldn't even play catcher. He'd be like a water boy or something. Um, he fit and, in a rowboat. <laughs> or he's this big fat bag of you know what. Anyway, yeah. So this is the thing. So remember also, actually, Grip strength really doesn't decrease a whole lot if you already have strong grips. Mm. Your isometric strength is one of the last things to go. And, and link your stupid doctor to this podcast, by the way, because I want to talk directly to him. <laughs> I'm just, you guys, I'm yeah. just going to vent for a minute. We love it. I'm so freaking sick of the most of my colleagues in the medical community that don't know what the hell they're talking about. Don't even ask another question have these flippant little bullshit dismissive answers. And no wonder why people are searching for care elsewhere. So anyway, right. so <clears throat> no, your isometric strength is one of the last things to go. That's why they call it old man strength. What I would say though, if you remember to one of our other episodes, we talked about in allostatic load, mm -hmm. the stress cup, right? One of the ways you can test your nervous system and the readiness mm. is your ability, is your own grip strength. And this is compared to you, not anybody else. Right. So when your dumb, fat, or <laughs> doctor had you, had you grip his strength, yeah, you're a jujitsu practitioner. Right. You're going to have grip strength, even on your worst day, well above the average person, probably, right. just like a rock climber. Right. Especially if you're a gi player. Carpenter or something. Of yes. Sort. Right. Right. So, I, anyway, I'm trying not to get just... So that test wasn't the best, is what you're saying? Well, no, you're not treating the patient. This doctor is just freaking being dismissive. Oh, let me see your finger. Oh, yes. oh no, you're fine. You know, this kind of nonsense. It's like, oh, you're a jiu-jitsu practitioner. Can you tell me a little bit about jiu-jitsu? Because I'm a fat ass and I don't do it. <laughs> right. Oh, it's a lot of grappling and grip strength. So your grips are probably stronger than the average person. Yeah. Oh, so this is probably not a good test for you. Mm. So... But but back to my point, what I would focus on, what's this guy's first name? Brian. Brian, really good question, man. What I would focus on is looking at your grip strength as part of allostatic load and how maybe you're overtrained a little bit, mm. okay? And it doesn't mean just your training. It means everything that encompasses it, your poor sleep, any other sources of stress, all can impact the nervous system, and the grip strength is just a surrogate measure to the state of readiness of your nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's why we use it first thing in the morning as a barometer for training. So, you know, if you have a, if you are uh, like 120 pounds on a dynamometer gripping, that's your baseline when you're feeling good. Yeah. And then you wake up one morning and you're at 90. Yeah. You're, you're probably, mm -hmm. you know, so if I had to guess not only your overall strength, but your endurance too, Mm -hmm. I think your nervous system may be fatigued more than anything. So I don't think more PT or more exercise is something. I would look at that first. Is that uh, grip fatigue mm -hmm. coming from the forearms? No. It's it's all within the actual hand? Well, yeah. I mean, physically, it's in the forearms. Sure, sure. Uh, but, I mean, ultimately, it comes from the brain. Okay. Okay, your motor cortex gives a signal down there. And, mm -hmm. and we can have, when the nervous system is fatigued, so to speak we have an inhibitory phenomenon that takes place where 
you're you're unable to to fully activate to your normal capacities, both in overall strength and endurance. Your nervous system goes, dude, we're fried. We're you know, because what is grip a surrogate for? If you think about it, when when I go up to something in daily life and put a real heavy grip on it. My brain knows I'm getting ready to do something heavy, mm. either lift something, put a ton of torque on something. Mm-hmm. So it prepares the entire body for that. And if you're not up to the task, it's going to inhibit that a little bit. Mm. Okay, so I would look there, Brian, first and kind of do a self-assessment on what you're thinking of, you know, how you're feeling as far as have you, you know, how's your training load? How's your sleep been? Have you been sick recently? Is your diet good? All those things feed into that kind of nervous system fatigue. It's, and the overtraining is the biggest, or under recovery, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you need to do exercises. You're a purple belt at this point. If you know this recently, another thing would be your age would be nice to know. Mm. Not because you get weaker with age, with grip strength necessarily, but because you'll have less of a recovery opportunity the older you get. Right. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. That's an awesome question. I'm sorry you have a jackass doctor. Go find a new one. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but good luck is hard anymore. I thought he said his age at some point, but I, he may. I didn't pick it up. If I did, no. I, I mean, in a previous previous uh, thing. Um, what what about this this guy? Is this going to the PT thing? Yeah, so, man. And so that's not a pr- now. If he said, "Hey, man, I, my knuckles are hurting like crap. I, there's just like m- pain and soreness." Okay. We could we could then consider opening up and, and working the extensors as well as okay. the flexors, right? No, this is more of a central a nervous system fatigue thing. I think, mm. and by doing more exercise, will probably be counterproductive for him. Got it. Supplements. Um. um like any sort of like, I mean, this obviously will, would go into like when you ask if his sleep is okay, if he says yeah. no, like he wakes up super it, early it would on be accident. De- it like, would be dependent on what his, what self-identified problems may be. Okay. If it's sleep, he'd have a different things that maybe could help. We've talked about before in other episodes. Right. Really very important question. Brian, thank you very much for that one. That's a good yeah. one. We would be interested to hear age and then um, but, also if, he self-evaluates that stuff that you're talking about if if he can give us a response but but again i want to emphasize that you don't grip strength if you have it already and you maintain it is one of the last things to go okay Mm. all i said is if you take a cross section of people i'm just reiterating what i said yeah if you general population those with coming into the test with the greatest grip strength right technically are correlated to have a less all-cause mortality that's all i'm saying and i I think it was Peter Atia has done a ton of research on that correlation, right? If if this doctor wants no, to... No, Peter Atia is just freaking parroting the studies like everyone else is. He hasn't done go. any research on it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, can, can you give me another doctor story? Get me all more fired up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't calling Brian a bitch on that. Just No, no. no. <laughs> I thought you were calling Peter a bitch. That's I was. <laughs> Whatever. Um, okay, another question. So, uh, long-time listener, first-time writer. He says, I'm 40 years old, and my testosterone levels are below 400. Mm-hmm. I get them measured two to three times per year. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned I won't be getting... I, I won't get the best options with my PCP. For those of you that doesn't mean phenylcycladine, it means Whoa. the drug. Sure. It means primary care provider oh. or primary care physician oh, okay so from his doc or nurse practitioner or whatever they sure are. I, he says i won't get my uh, get the best options from uh, my doc what is a good integrated medicine practice <laughs> in the ever area are you kidding me <laughs> well he i don't know if he's a long-time listener he might he might be a uh, a, a newer listener in the Everett area he's local to us yeah uh you know, I might be biased, but I think the best hormone person in the freaking region is my wife. Yeah. In Stanwood. Yeah. And she is still taking new patients only for hormones and some other things. She's not taking regular primary care General, patients because yeah. she doesn't have enough room anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, A, you're probably right. 99.9% chance your doctor's going to say you're normal and fine. Yeah. Go back and listen to Carrie's. Um, yeah, we have a testosterone episode. That Carrie actually talked about. Liv, can you look up what episode that was? Uh, yeah. we, we have a testosterone episode where we had Dr. Carrie on. And so you can kind of get a feel for, in my opinion, having a doctor that, 
I don't know. No, say it. Is you connect with a little bit and like you feel like they're actually have your best interests in mind and, and you're not just a number. And she's a jujitsu black belt. Yes. And she doesn't treat numbers. She right. treats you and how you're feeling because we've talked about this before. The levels to a certain extent are just a surrogate, right? Yeah. And I might feel great at 800. You know, yeah. someone else might feel great at 600. Mm-hmm. Someone else might feel really good and perfect at 1,000. We have a friend, a uh, fellow black belt, that is right in that, like, low 500 range. And he's one of the most productive people I know. And he feels fine. He always thinks about taking it because <laughs> he's 40. Yeah. But he, he's like, he, he sleeps fine. Yeah. His lifting is good. It, that's right. And, and what Carrie yeah. will say is she she has a whole questionnaire she uses yeah. to identify symptoms and it's not correlated with 400 for some people 400 sucks for them they feel like shit i'm one of them right i'm literally like when i when i am in that range my sleep is nowhere near my recovery oh it's episode 10 episode 10 is the trt yeah or the testosterone so it's pretty far back there um whether you listen to audio or video um but episode 10 excuse me so when I am in that 400 range, sorry, you are just burping. I'm so sorry. Wow. It doesn't smell good either. <laughs> it smells like the inside of a fake leg. It's pretty bad. So go ahead. So yes. When so, I'm in that 400 to 500 range, my sleep takes a hit. I am absolutely my recovery. When I train the later that day, like if it's a daytime train uh, or I train during the day, I'm crushed for the rest of the day doing anything very physical it like takes me to like call myself a pussy and stuff like that like i have to tough talk myself and then the next day if it was a medium to heavy training day as in like i got five to eight hard rounds in or something the next day i'm crushed i i'm absolutely like i'm struggling to like have energy i actually start to feel it's a similar feeling if when I get really lean, like I'm like once 173 pounds, mm-hmm. when I get down to like That's that, really lean yeah, you, I get yeah. really lean. I can feel my muscles in not a good, good way, like mm-hmm. kind of like the tightness of them. Mm-hmm. Similar when I have a hard training session and my, my, my levels are lower. Interesting. I feel like this muscle soreness yep. that is super uncomfortable and that will last a day or two. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a perfect point. Um, and the reason why is there's so much individual variation is there's a lot going on under, under the hood. It's not just your, your total serum testosterone levels. Yeah. Right. Sex hormone binding globulin. Something we can't test for is androgen receptor resistance. There's all kinds of things that are, that have individual variation. Um, and that's why Carrie does a full, she'll not just do. Yeah. Just 45 your, minutes with your physician. And it's not that bullshit where, you can only ask about a certain subject, yeah. a certain whatever you're there for is the subject you have to stay on. It It's just different. Yeah. It, it is absolutely different. Stanwood Integrated Medicine. Yeah, that's and, a slam dunk if you're in the, if you're in this area. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, of course I'm biased. She's my wife, but geez, yeah. dude, she's awesome. The thing it's is like, like a 20 minute drive north of Everett. Literally. Yeah. Like we live in Everett, um, Olivia and I. And the thing is, you know, I've... I, before I was seeing Carrie as my doctor was for all my urology stuff. I went to UW medicine. What was that? Or a polyclinic. I think it was. No, there was, I went UW medicine and polyclinic. I, I've done both. Yeah. Cause yeah. And it's nowhere near as good. One, they will try to push whatever gel or topical that, that they can make $1,300 every two weeks on mm-hmm. whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's worth it. The once every three to six months to drive to, even if this is not just for people that are here local to us, if you find out that there is an integrative medicine with a good physician there and they're an hour away, you're th- these people, you're only going to see literally once or twice a year. It's worth it. Yep. It's absolutely worth it. Especially with my rant about the state of medicine anymore, because yeah. most of these freaking, I swear. We can get Chris fired up again. Nah, nah, <laughs> no, but yeah, if you're local, it's a no-brainer to me. Yeah. So um, 
I would say consider that. Um, if you need more information or something, uh, you can just email us cause you already, you already emailed us and I yep. can get you that, yep. that kind of info. Um, okay. Well, let me switch off that one. I'm going to do this one. So leg raises after a choke. What the F are people doing? I'll read the question. We've had this question before. Yeah. Well, we're going to do it again. You dingo. Okay. That's that guy's name is Dingo Berry. Oh, I like it. <laughs> oh, I, I like it just the name. <laughs> That's sweet. It's literally Dingo Berry 411. I like it. Everyone's going to spam email him now. Wow. Um, he says, big fan of the podcast. I'm fairly new to BJJ, although I've been a combat sports fan for a long time. He watches UFC and stuff like that. I've seen quite a large amount of fights and subsequently a bunch of people getting choked completely unconscious. I'm still very baffled at the practice of elevating someone's legs when they've gone unconscious. I'd love to hear Chris speak on that a little bit. And he provided a link of someone having this done to him. Yep. So when someone gets choked unconscious, yep. they're laying their dead dead body, and then the ref or even the opponent starts raising their, their, yep. their heels uh, to about the waist height. What's so, going on? yeah. So the idea behind that is when you get choked out, your carotids are cut off. You lose perfusion to the brain. And the idea is using gravity because there's a lot of blood stored in the legs. The idea is to make it easier for the heart. So it's not pumping. It's harder to pump up. So it's well, and you also got the it. force of the Venus yeah. return coming down. Uh, has it ever been studied? Is it a beneficial? I don't know. The problem I have is. I've been choked out in competition mm -hmm. and I woke up to some dude shaking my legs and yeah. some people freak out. Yeah. Cause some people shake them. You don't need to do that. Yeah. If you want to do that, what I would say is to make the person feel safe because they're coming to, they don't know what the hell happened uh -huh. is you can slide a knee under their calves, put their legs up at 90 degrees. You know, like you're imagine you're like laying shelving up, them. Yeah. You're shelving them. And then just kind of putting their, your hand on their shoulder and like waiting for them to start to come to them. Like, hey, it's all right. Mm. You know, we don't need to be shaking someone around. Mm -hmm. Okay, that doesn't do any good. The idea is, and if you're going to do that, but that's the idea. So to create a little gravity assist yeah. with blood out of the legs to help. Um, so it's not pooling in Can the I legs. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Would it help even more? Uh-oh. If let's say you're on your back mm -hmm. and I just choked you completely unconscious, mm -hmm. you're drooling. It's very ugly. Yep. If I grabbed, because most people, they grab their ankles then yeah, they lift them about their waist height and they mm -hmm. kind of like almost like jostle them around. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't it's, recommend that. Okay. Instead of jostling, if I like lean forward, so I'm almost, you're almost in an L shape <laughs> and then I put your like calves on my shoulders <laughs> And then I just kind of like lean over you. No, because I feel like that's a Me Too move <laughs> moment or something. Well, this is more scientific than that. It ain't scientific, dude. I feel a little vulnerable at that point. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's going to be a little weird for both of us. But mainly me. What you doing? Mainly then? me. Because maybe I'm forcing the blood up. <laughs> hmm. Forcing <laughs> someone's blood up. You're doing something weird is what I think. So you're saying no, don't do it. I'm saying no, don't do that. It's unnecessarily weird, and you might have a reaction you're not looking for, and someone comes to and finds themselves in that position with your crazy face staring down at them. And you just say, wake up. Looks, wake of, up. looks of lust, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm going to put, the, yeah, I'm gonna put okay. the, let's put a X on that one. Okay. Well, there good, you go, good, qu good question, though, Bill. <laughs> um. Another question. Okay. We're just banging these out today. Dude. Get me all fired up, too. I got Let's a loose going. B. I got a loose <laughs> B today. It's coming out. No sound. Okay. Hi, long-time listener. First time writing in. Oh, that's funny. I used that joke earlier, but he actually said it. He said, oh, yeah. I'm enjoying y'all's opinions on what I what is expected at each belt level. I'm a four-stripe purple belt. Big baller. Definitely not on the cusp of brown belt. Okay. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> you you kind of are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not chasing the belt. Okay. But I don't feel comfortable at four stripes, especially when we line up and and I'm beat to a pulp standing ahead. 
of the people that just flattened me. What should I be focused on at this point to best represent where I stand in line and prepare and, and to prepare me for Brown Belt? Yeah. One, I'm gonna, I want you to go first, but let me just say. Okay. One, super common. I was going to say. This thought. Absolutely. This mentality. Yep. Super common. Yep. Go ahead. Stop it. I almost thought I wrote that thing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because Olivia's a force. Right? Beca- well, I know. And so then you're all of a sudden you're in the spotlight there and you're seeing these murderers behind you. Guess what? That shit doesn't get any better. Yeah. Especially when you're standing in front of the room as a black belt and you're looking yeah. at these freaking brown and purple belts that have just given yeah. you the, you know, I oh, mean, yeah. sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, just do you yeah do you know it sounds like you're already very self-reflective you know, yeah. kind of introspective and looking to improve yeah you're gonna have that there's gonna be someone that has your number yeah and, and age athleticism and he's in his 40s yeah that's right and it's okay mm-hmm. it's okay um you know it's okay to have a you know a 54 year old black belt get caught by a a purple belt mm-hmm. okay Mm-hmm. Who who cares? Yeah, we're 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 training partners. That pressure you're feeling though is very common. Yeah, and it's okay. It's a normal thing. And um, then you start having imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. And you'll yeah. feel like you're never ready for brown belt or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Focus on your game. What you're if you have some perceived weaknesses, focus on them. But don't don't live and die by who wins the sparring. Mm-hmm. Okay. That is one of the hardest things to deal with and not allow I know. in. Uh, that's why we're talking about yeah, it. Yeah. That is one of the things that it's so, especially if you have any sort of competitive blood in you. Yeah. It is so hard to not care if you lose or maybe you didn't even lose the round. It's not about not caring. It's just don't let it affect your who you are. Right. It's not your identity. Right. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, the, I, I find I will like get, get on myself. I, even if I, maybe it's a round that I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing well in. Mm-hmm. But there's one thing that happens. You're the worst, by, by the way. Why? What are you talking about? No, at this. Oh. I'm glad you're talking about yeah. it because yeah, yeah. you're very bad. You take that s- stuff home with you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, she's agreeing Easy with me. over there. No, but I mean, but it, what yeah. what I'm I'm giving Bill a hard time, but what I'm saying is Bill's a black belt and a very good black belt, and he still feels this. Yeah. So it's okay. And the imposter syndrome thing, man, that is that is crazy. So in mm-hmm. something that I've had to hear you say, even Olivia say it, others, is <clears throat> When that time comes that you get that brown belt, you you need to trust your instructor that you know you're you know if you're at a McDojo that hands out belts yeah. for attendance only. Right. You you'll know that. And if you are, then you know, understand that and you're gonna have to do your own work to overcome that and part of that in my opinion would be like cross training Mm -hmm. tournaments to help get your skill level to the point that you 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 feel more comfortable yeah also tournaments and cross training in my opinion help give you confidence it's not that you'll always do well because you can drop into a place and there's some competitive blue belt that is like giving you the business can you imagine being at AOJ with Colabate yes. when he was a, a a blue belt? Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. E- even you're going to have that. Yes, and even to the point where uh, I have a friend named Aurelius. He um, great example. Yeah, he lives in Texas and he trains with uh, pros. So they have pro training um, a- along with their other classes. But in the pro training, there's Victor Hugo. There's a guy named Jan Pika Pau, which he went against Tynan. Mm-hmm. Um, there's brown belt world champions uh, that are now black belts, so they're young and all that. One of the guys at the brown at brown belt, he got 
silver at Brown Belt Worlds last year when Cole was, he had Cole in the finals, Cole Abate, mm-hmm. and put Cole through like, he had him in an arm bar. Like, so this guy's a savage. So this is the pedigree of room he's in. Aurelius is very strong, quite technical. He's, he's good. But he's also a 40 year old dude. <laughs> and he told me about when they invited him to pro training, and he's like, why? You know, it's, well, it's just another body. They know he's tough and like, you know, can provide good looks. So he goes and he's like, every single guy is just beating the brakes off me one after another. And then he finally, after he gets all these black belts, he finally, oh, there's, there's a blue belt. He finally gets to roll with. Uh-oh. And it's some 18 year old from Brazil. And he had about 50 pounds on him. And he's like, the guy's, working him he's just making him fight for his life and he finally gets into a good position he just laid on him and he's like i'm just gonna give him all 210 pounds and just like just try to hold out till the end of the round yeah this is a really this is a stud dude you know yeah and it's like that's gonna happen so you have to like you basically just said you have to take into account whether it's age and all this kind of stuff um, it all comes into play, you know. Well, and everyone has different allostatic loads in their life too, right? Like, Ooh, no doubt. I love that. <laughs> and are you someone that has a work schedule where maybe you're not totally a uh, um, uh, what's that night shift person like graveyard? Yeah. But maybe you do. You got to get to work by five a.m. Like you're brimming, you know, and like that. But you're training at late at night mm-hmm. and. Do you have stressors going on? Did your house flood? <laughs> like, you know, something like that. I just think she just said that in one word. Yeah, again, you're, it, word, you're wordy again. Right. I am wordy. <laughs> that all fits under allostatic load. Yeah. Very good, Olivia. Well, our yeah. podcast would be four minutes long if we just That's did. very concise. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. I'm going to make your b-hole loose. <laughs> oh, Are you sure? Yeah, I'm going to choke you on and I'm going to put you in the recessatory position that I thought of. Oh, my God. <laughs> Gosh. Then you're going to have to pay for my PTSD freaking therapy. I'll make you watch American Psycho. Over oh, over my God. Again. I've just witnessed it. So um, get out of your own head. Yep. I've said this before. That's Marcellus Wallace. That's pride. Everyone with you, bro. Yeah, that's right. And it's a little bit of pride, a little bit of ego. Mm-hmm. You have to have those. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to be a pushover. Yeah. You have to have some of that confidence. It's something I struggle with the most. So, no, for sure. And there's, it, but it's a balance. But don't take it home with you, man. Yeah. And don't think less of yourself. And it's that that whole comparison game. We've talked mm-hmm. about this all the time. Yeah. Right. For sure. Comparison is the enemy. Yeah. Are you comparing yourself? Yeah. To that 28 year old purple belt. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That just mm-hmm. like he said, just worked you over. Mm-hmm. It's it's. We all got our own journey. And like I said, trust your instructor that when they put that stripe on you, they put that new belt on you, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're putting their name on you. That's correct. So not to put more weight because sometimes that weighs on me. It's like (laughs) I'll make my, my professor look like an idiot. They knowingly are putting this brown belt on you. Trust them. I know we have a topic. I had a uh, on our professor's request. So I have a little story that happened at lunch this weekend. Oh, so you know we trained. We had a good training day on Saturday. Yeah. So we went to our normal hangout that we hadn't been to in a while. Yeah, in a long time. And a waitress there. We've been doing sushi. I know the waitress there does not like to be cheated on for us going to other places because she's used to. And she did. I, I missed this one, but yeah. Did Andrew tell you about this? It was funny. She goes, oh, someone else from your gym was in here as a regular. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you train over there at Jiu- Jitsu, you know, Cascade Jiu-Jitsu. And they're like, you know Chris and Carrie? He goes, oh, I love Chris and Carrie. I'm like, oh, yeah, and Andrew? She goes, he goes, oh, yeah, I know Andrew. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and his face deflated <laughs> right there. So uh, there hurt, yeah, hurt and, she, and, and she could tell she got on him. He goes, who is this? And so we got a dis- she got a description. Who was it? it I'm not going to tell you. Call him out. No. 
Because I'll wait for Andrew to mess with them a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just thought it was funny. Though. Can you and tell it, me when we stop? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I just it was just it was just funny how the um the the dynamics at academies yeah. and the local community. It's just funny. Oh, anyway, yeah. it's just a little quick little thing. I don't um know. you so guys can that, cut it out if you want to. Oh no. <laughs> we're gonna make you look dumb. So with this question, that kind of leads us. Yep. We'll reverse it a little bit though. What makes a purple belt to us? Mm. If you were a pr- professor that a teaching professor that you have the ability to promote, if someone is right there, what are you looking for for that person to get that purple belt? Okay. I'll start off by saying I think this is the one of the most important belts. Purple? Yep. Okay. It's the biggest transition belt. Mm. You come from more of a beginner, advanced beginner to a someone that knows what they're doing mm. in jiu-jitsu can really... Which basically every high level instructor, Andre Goval, mm-hmm. Mendez Brothers, Marcelo, Robert Drysdale, I've heard Hodger, Gracie, I've mm-hmm. all these, Eddie Bravo, say that Purple Belt is your first step into being advanced it in is. jiu-jitsu. And I agree 100%. The way I'm going to break this down to keep it organized, because otherwise I'll just, I have lots of ideas. I'd like to go off and, and, break this down into let's start out with the standing game Mm. okay okay if you don't if you don't mind going with me on how we'll organize this i like it and then you can tell me your standing game requirements Mm -hmm. then we'll go into we'll go from there okay so i don't expect especially you know i would be a hypocrite if i expected it i don't want to expect everyone to be a high level wrestler at that Mm -hmm. i don't expect them to be a a judoka however um you know, I think from standing, you should at least on the wrestling side have a good, uh, some kind of single leg variation. Double legs are a little more technical with the shot. Some kind of single leg or ankle pick, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, from the judo side, something that fits more into jujitsu, in my opinion, like uh, uh, Sumi Gaeshi mm-hmm. uh, or Tomonagi. Mm, very fancy with your terminology I thi- today. But. Those are two that yes. have, you know, that almost you could be called like an aggressive guard pull almost, mm-hmm. you know, with those, both of those are, are, and they're good against the BJJ, the typical jujitsu stance, which is hips back, hips head back. Low. Exactly. I'd like to see some type of, you know, it doesn't have to be because some of the, some of the, the judo stuff takes a lot of drilling. And yeah. I think those two kind of flow, but you it's should more timing base. My point is you should have some answers on the feet and, um, your guard pull, and I like go, I like pulling guard, but I try to do it aggressively directly into a sweeping position and not just pull for safety, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. I want to pull it so I'm ready to attack or sweep. Okay, I'd like to see that in a purple belt from the standing position. I don't expect, like I said, high-level wrestling. Of course not. I don't expect a full gamut of uh, judo techniques, but more jujitsu centered. I want people to have some answers, mm. a, a couple of those. Mm-hmm. And those are the thought, those, those are the things that I thought were reasonable at purple belt level. Yeah. You want me? To, of okay. course. Yeah. Let's okay. go so for each from, segment that you have. I'd like to do that. <clears throat> so keep it easy. I'm pretty similar. I do want someone to have some basics of like self-defense style, uh, stand up. Mm. So what I mean by that is, if someone puts you in like a big brother headlock, what do you do from there? Gotcha. Um, I'm, I'm not saying you have to make it your A, like your A game, like this is what I'm going to do. Um, but I would like to see some knowledge and some proficiency in um, some of the basic, most basic throws that are jiu-jitsu oriented so i'm i'm kind of i fell down the danaher brian glick uh mentality when it comes to jiu-jitsu which um very popular youtuber uh how do you say his name hit hitashi damn he's got a good he's got a great judo youtube page oh yeah uh, yeah is he the um is he the cor- is he the yeah coral he's belt? a coral belt but yeah. he trains with brian glick and yeah, he, and, and he's had like Travis Stevens on before. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I've, um, I've seen him. 
you know, he, he he's a great lesson on YouTube. I, I can't remember his name though. Um, anyways, so and, and that's there's certain judo moves that are good in jiu-jitsu and low risk. For example, turning throws can be uh, very risky because yes. you're exposing you're you're giving back exposure to apply a throw, and in in judo this isn't as dangerous as doing it in jiu-jitsu so a lot of time like danaher uh he favors like a drop tayatoshi or a sumageishi or uh, like the tomonagis or balloon sweeps yada yada even ashiwaza which is foot sweeps right shintaro is that it shintaro um and then uh so i i would like to see some sort of proficiency in that and that doesn't like i said doesn't mean it has to be your a game but you know what it is you yeah. understand yeah the concepts in it i i like that i i think um some of the the foot sweeps um i would add that too yeah just some general yeah i because that's that's that, that whole kazushi thing yeah, yeah. exactly and yeah. i think by learning the kazushi principles and then really where that all drives into is grip structure if if you go with a lid, like someone that's decent at judo, I'm not even saying a black belt, but just decent at judo, they've done judo for a couple of years. No, I'm not even saying exclusively, but they've participated in it and they've practiced it. You're going to notice immediately their grip structure in the standing position is different. And you're like, oh, okay, this is whether you try to break the grip and you can't or... You can't off balance them as easy. You can't shoot on them because they understand basic grip structure. Okay, I think that is maybe something I, I would have to have. So not necessarily a move, but the understanding of grip structure inside position, high grip compared to a lower lapel grip, sleeve control, steering wheel m- movements, um, and then on the wrestling side. Uh, I think ankle picks are, are absolute, which are kind of a form of a single, right, right in a way. Right. Um, swing singles. Right? You know, this is just my game, right? Th- this, these are things that I like to do. So, inevitably, I would want to show them. Um, I think, the, but I think they're reasonably technically. Yeah, because yeah. let me t- uh, a real good double leg is is highly technical. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, that shot itself is very yeah. technical. It, and the thing is, in a jiu-jitsu sense, it can get you into trouble. I sure it can. Guillotines and such. Yeah, that's why I, I think we're on the same page on so that one. The, those are some things that I would like to see. Now, there might be some people listening to this that are like, well, I don't know, like that are like two striped blue belts. And they're like, I don't know anything in the stand. Like, I don't feel comfortable anywhere. Well, this is probably your sign to start putting some effort into that. Now, maybe your coach doesn't care. Maybe they don't even like, you know, start standing very much you know that that's totally like i i don't think necessarily andrew thinks too much about it like as in he's i don't think he is now we have huge classes so it's hard for us to start standing right until it's like towards the end of sparring yeah totally <laughs> but i mean we're working on sotagaris right now for warm-ups yeah so exactly it's not like we neglect it Mm-mm. it's just to up, get the sparring time, the randori time, mm-hmm. can be a little bit difficult in our gym. Your gym might be similar. Mm-hmm. Um, and your professor might not put too much emphasis on it. But most likely, they will want to know that you have some knowledge at a minimum there. And that's where you can take a training partner and you guys can, you know, maybe near the end yes. of sparring or open mat time. Yes. And use it for that. There's something in judo called fit drills. Yep. Just doing fit drills is, is it's basically the beginning movement you're, of you're making that connection yeah you're you're it's just the the beginning part to get to the connection that you can do the yeah. same thing with 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 wrestling honestly is something that i've heard a lot of like high level wrestlers talk about is uh, something called shadow wrestling mm-hmm. it's very similar to shadow boxing that and it's similar if you if we have gun nuts out there dry firing dry fire drills you know pull garment pull present right racking on present it's like you're just shadow boxing. Mm-hmm. Shadow wrestling is going to be the same thing. You're going to look ugly. You're going to look dumb. You're going to look silly. 
but you're going through movements with visualization. Nicky Rod is really like he preaches shadow wrestling all the time. Like he loves doing it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're visualizing matches and stuff. You're going to get better by just doing that. So agreed. But again, you don't have to have a. I wouldn't want to see some gigantic rep- repertoire on that because I don't have it. Yeah. Well, but okay. But but my point is though, you know, those you need to have some answers on the feet yeah. and you need to have a couple things drilled pretty well i'd like to see some comfort there yeah, yeah. exactly and not just pulling close guard mm-hmm. you know that's maybe another thing have some guard pulls well that's what i mean yeah. but but you know like how about let's let's pull to half guard let's mm-hmm. pull to a, some kind of sweeping position yeah you know pull to single leg um x um there's all kinds of yes you you definitely especially in a jiu-jitsu sense and i didn't even touch on that you did i you gotta have at least one good guard pull that you're not pulling into side control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. You, you have to be able to, to, to pull guard. Uh, yep. Safely. So you don't blow your lower back out. Yeah. And then um, efficiently. I like it. Next. That's pretty next. Uh, let's talk about guard. Mm. So those of you that are coming in high level wrestlers, you've got to blue belt maybe without developing a guard quickly too. Yeah. Um, which can definitely happen. Um, I let's start with closed guard. I, you, <laughs> I know, Bill. I'll, I do think you. I do think you need to to become even if you don't have you know let's say you have short little legs and you have a hard time closing them. You, it's a really good position. I've re, I'm rediscovering it again at black belt. Um, I'm using it a lot. Um, but you should be able to chain some things together. I'd like to see your close guard be able to chain, um, go to shoot a triangle that the right to arm bar. If that's not working, you know, you have a sweep right there, like mm-hmm. a pendulum sweep or something, mm-hmm. you know, that you can, you, you got that timing down. Okay. Um, and using your close guard to set up maybe an open guard that you like. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those transitions between the sure. two. So don't neglect that. Um, it's a fundamental jujitsu position. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean you got to love to play it. Mm-hmm. I want to see some kind of um, bill. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, and, but it doesn't have to be exhaustive. You don't have to have a Hodger Gracie closed guard. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tra- being able to transition to an open guard. I'd like to see um, people at least have some at purple belt have some facility in a couple different open guards that you can transition in and out of, mm-hmm. whether it's De La Hiva, reverse De La Hiva, um, butterfly, X guard, whatever. Have have two or three that you can seamlessly transition in and out of. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have these. You don't have to have super fancy stuff, but um, something that you can generate good kazushi from mm-hmm. and open up opportunities. Um, and, and feel comfortable. Like I said, it doesn't have to be an encyclopedic. Mm-hmm. But I, the but, depth of the the s- skills in that position don't have to be super deep. But you want to have the core part sharp. And if you're one of those blue belts that really hasn't developed a good guard because you have some natural attributes or a wrestling background and don't like mm-hmm. being on your back, you need to change that. Yeah. I mean, you can still get your purple belt, but you're going to be well. I will tell you behind the curve. We have a purple belt. That is terrifyingly strong, really good wrestler, and oh by the way, now has developed a guard, yeah. and he's a real problem. Right? Oh yeah. Right. Even yeah. more so than if he wouldn't have developed that. Yes. So, um, so that's what do you think about the yeah. guard game? So, I do <clears throat> agree with the with the close guard that it's something that you need to know how to at least maybe your attacks won't be too robust. But can you hold someone? Can you write out the clock and you got 30 seconds left in a match and you're up? You need to be able to throw someone in close guard and just like wrap them up, tie them up, get their hands to the mat, break posture, and just subdue them. Because that's kind of a self-defense thing too. Yeah, nice control. You're saying for control. Yes. Yeah, I like it. Um, understanding the concepts of getting their hands to the mats, having inside position, overhooks, underhooks, what to do when you have an overhook, what what to do when you have an underhook. Um, You know, the most basic cross-collar choke like needs to be um, 
accessible. Like you need to understand the mechanism to that and why closed guard is so good for the cross collar choke. Um, guards, I think at that point you should know a guard that you like. You've gravitated towards something. You probably uh, have found that that is your kind of go-to. So that guard should be starting to get kind of sharp. For instance, at Blue Belt, mine was half guard. I was developing. Mm. Yeah. So your sweeps were, you had more than one. Yep. By the time you're getting your purple. Yep. You had a half, let, let's say a handful of sweeps mm -hmm. that you could kind of go to. Mm -hmm. um, and then even transition, maybe you had another guard that if they started kind of staying low and like getting out of your half guard, you're like, okay, well, now I'm going to go to daily heave or what, whatever you right. have something that you kind of chain to that i'd go to inside uh reverse daily heave yeah oh. right from that. so yeah to, to your point yeah, yeah you you have something you got not, not saying that it's black belt level not saying that it's incredibly deep with technique but you have identified something you're working on now that means that purple belt explore a little bit still refine that sword sharpen that sword but start exploring other guards once but you we're get not into purple but we're not too purple right right we're still looking to like to get there mm -hmm. so at blue you found something you like and you mm -hmm. kind of latched onto it and you really started developing it mm -hmm. um now what guard that is eh, it's up to you that's right I, I i don't i don't think like if someone is a blue belt and they are not very good at like spider guard, mm -hmm. even though that's something I play spider mm -hmm. lasso. Um, I wouldn't necessarily hold that against them. They're like, oh, they can barely do or They can't do spider or they can barely do it. It's like, yeah. I would, that's a pretty robust and base. I don't want to say basic, but like a, a standard guard mm -hmm. in our martial art. So I would want you to know how to get into it. And, like, at least be there. But it doesn't have to be something that you're, like, good at, even though that's something I'm good at. No, for sure. Yeah. But but like you said, you know, a, a couple. Yeah. And one that you're really working. Have something that, that is obviously, like, a go-to, an A game. You've developed, like, what people say, a game. You've kind of developed right. a passing game. Or, or on guards. You've developed a, a, a guard game that you can fall into and feel comfortable and, immediately. And if I've not already said this, not just locking someone down specifically, not playing fully defensive, making your guard offensive. Yes, 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 yes. That's important at Blue Belt. Yeah, you're not just, you know, to our heavy set friends that just love going to deep half and just letting them sit, sit on their chest until the last second then roll. No, like be offensive. Make them feel uncomfortable. In your have yeah. the momentum. I like, <laughs> I like how you brought that back. Thank you. I like it. Yeah, I, I think from a guard perspective. That, yeah. Uh, are we going to talk about submissions? Oh, we're okay. I got a whole thing. Okay, I wasn't sure. Next, just to keep the timing, and we could go off on probably a whole episode for each one, but uh, we'll keep it a little. I'll more try to sharpen it up a little bit. Yeah, Sorry. a little bit. You Sorry. know, a little more concise. Um, next thing, let's just call it top game. Okay, and we'll start. With the top game, we'll start passing. This one, I want more than the guard. I want you to have more than just, like we just said, one at least one guard that is like... I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I want you to have actually more guard passes than than guards <laughs> to play. Well, it's important. Yes. Yep. The chaining. Right. Ha As you do jujitsu more, you realize it's rarely the first move guard or passing but especially in passing sometimes in guard work you just you feel them off balance and you just kept going with them mm -hmm. and the first move you did got them in guard passing it's kind of rare especially as you like progress up mm -hmm. that you're just gonna like slam an x pass like yeah you might do that to the blue belt if you're a black belt or something like that or right. a brown belt but or even a purple belt but have a few passes that you can go to and I would honestly, like me personally, I want you to know, I want you to be able to explain to me what you're doing. I want that level of understanding that you can tell me, now, I'm not saying it has to be absolutely perfect and eloquent, but you can tell me what you're feeling 
that causes you to do it and then what you're actually doing from a like grip structure and stuff like that yeah um exactly i think you should also don't just stay on one type um i know i tend to navigate towards i like to pass through Mm. pressure pass Mm -hmm. um inside passing inside passing versus outside passing usually it's just to to athleticism and try not to get myself injured sure but which kind of lends to something we talked about earlier is like because i i don't do close guard too much right is i'm lending to or i'm trying to i have certain blessings in my Mm -hmm. physical capabilities Mm -hmm. and certain the opposite mm-hmm. and i'm just trying to go towards that and same same with you your athleticism just due to age mm-hmm. and time has has dwindled so you're now changing your game to be to fit that that's right right and there's nothing wrong with that but yeah. i definitely i know how to toriando i know you know i know how to mm-hmm. do the other stuff i know how to pass a spider guard well, when i show stuff you're walking around helping me right even though i'm showing passes that you're yeah. not necessarily going to like you try too much, but you're able to walk around and help correct people. That's right. Yeah. And so it's important to, um, but like you mentioned something earlier about the passing is, um, you know, for instance, like I like to trap a leg and start half guard, but sometimes I'll, cu- I'll go right to a knee cut mm. depending on what their reaction is. Mm-hmm. Or if they throw up a knee shield, I have a, you know, you gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta be dynamic with that. <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> know when to back out of something too. Mm. You know, you're getting loaded. Do you know? Do you, do you want that that knowledge level? Um, at Purple Belt, this is a general theme, and we're applying it to guard passing here. You should start thinking a little more of a mental game, and not that you're going to discard the physical part of it. In other words, if I'm stuck, I see this a lot in lower belts. They get stuck on something. And they're going to make it happen, hell or high water. Mm-hmm. I'm going to force this pass. That's not the. That's not what I want to see in a purple belt. I want to say, hey, I'm getting a. Is there a more efficient way to go? Mm. What are they giving me mm-hmm. instead of like I'm going to force my will on them through this no matter what? Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to make this half guard pass happen. I probably might want to back out and and they're giving me another look. I might want to switch to something, and that's what I mean by being able be a little more. Um, don't get so closed in and closed minded on something. That's mm-hmm. what I mean by that. Mm. I don't expect you to have full technical ability to, you know, in every situation, but, but I do want to see that you're not like a dog on a bone mm. when you don't have to be. Mm. Looking at you, Sam. What? <laughs> oh, we're talking to Sam. <laughs> oh, you're talking to, yeah, yeah. I see what you're He's saying. like a dog on a bone. <clears throat> Okay, I wasn't gonna call anybody out. I like <laughs> when he see, when he sees a donut, dude. The <laughs> look on the how side. dare you? Saw. I was gonna say, dude. What, what were you projecting? He is. Projecting. I did wear a donut rash guard today. Oh, that's unfortunate. What? Yeah. How dare you? So, the, yeah. you know what I mean. I don't yeah. want people to be so. Whether it's a submission, whether it's a position. This kind of is an overarching thing. I want to see of a purple belt to start looking for what they're giving you, not what you want to impose on them necessarily. Sure. And I think that's important. Um, but the passing, it doesn't have to be encyclopedic. I want to see some solid, um, some solid technique on some fundamental passes and have some inside and some outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, as it, it also was, some some of the different ranges you'd like to totally see some proficiency there. Yep. Okay. What else? So we'll just keep moving. Yep. Um, uh, after passing, uh, uh, pinning positions, I want to see good transitions. Okay. Okay. In other words, I want you to be able to seamlessly flow depending on what that person's doing. Kind of surf them a little bit, mm-hmm. right? Uh, not necessarily, you know, just hold, you know, if someone's giving you a hard time with their hips on side control, you want sh- I, you should already switch over your frames and move to north south. Let's or- also preface this: this is with people of similar level or even lower. We're not saying you got to have like where you pin someone. Oh yeah, y- you're a four stripe blue belt. You've pinned a brown belt, and you're seamlessly no. not allowing them up. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Very good point. Yeah. But in general. You should be, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. At appropriate skill level, you should be able to transition. Mm-hmm. 
um, smoothly. You know, whether these are um, backstepping out of things, um, we're moving from, uh, you know, technical mount to the back, mm. you know, uh, moving from the back, knowing when to transition back over to mount if you're mm-hmm. losing it, that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Um, is for the, for the top game um, and being being good in most of those positions. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with the pinning stuff. I I, I would like to see you be able to go from one side to north south to the other side mm-hmm. while keeping someone pinned um, you, using the appropriate transfers of your limbs to block hips when you need to mm-hmm. and stuff like that uh mm-hmm. the obvious knowledge of whatever which way you point the face they're not going to be able to turn the opposite so using shoulder pressure or hip pressure to point the face away from you the biomechanics we talked about yeah yeah, yeah. so i i think that's that's uh pretty mm-hmm. big now knowing i don't think it's you know knowing twister side compared yeah. to you know, whatever other the case of Katami and stuff like that, like knowing those like super in depth, not as important to me as just because if you get into, as you learn those positions, if you understand pinning, you'll be able to do those. Once you learn what twister side is, once you learn what twister side is, if you understand cross body control or diagonal, as Dan or her talks about, what does he call that? When it's a diagonal across like shoulder to hip, Oh, the um, the power line, power, yeah, yeah. W- once you understand that concept, when you do, t- you get shown what twister side is. The only reason I use that is because obviously different than other side yeah. controls. Is you're going to be able to apply it really well right away. That's rotational control, yeah. basically hips and shoulders. Um, I had a dang it, it was gone. I had something profound to say. Yeah, that was. Um, oh yeah. yeah. So I also don't want to see you getting inside control and hugging them to death like your life depended on it, just trying to power them down and not using getting up on toes. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see knees on the ground a lot. You should have some of the pressure principles down. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's really important as far as um, energy conservation too. And you should start being developing that as a purple belt. Yeah. And the yeah. ability to float a little bit better. So when that, day one person comes in Mm -hmm. or first month person comes in and you've mounted them. Yep. Not saying you never get rolled, but more often than not, when they're like thrashing around, you're kind of floating them a little bit. Yep. Um, You're not getting reversed from side control uh, from someone like that. Like in my opinion, at that when you're getting ready for your purple belt, you should be able to control those people pretty well without a lot of energy yeah like yes you you should be able to feel quite dominant and comfortable with those people Mm -hmm. and i recommend roll with those people yep you need to roll with those people it's the closest thing to a self-defense scenario it's a confidence booster you're going to be able to work on stuff and they're going to do weird stuff you start to get unfortunately we start to get used to grappling against other grapplers so when we roll with someone that does something weird like a new person sometimes if you haven't rolled with someone like that it like throws you off and you're almost like you for you forget jujitsu because we're like that's dumb why would you do that right well it kind of (laughs) worked because you are so used to this one kind of thinking and uh that's a yeah good point next um submissions i'll let you go wow okay so there's some of the core submissions I would like. Yeah, you have to have. I'm I'm stingy on this one because I'm an armbar guy. Mm-hmm. You have to have very good armbar technique. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying the setups. I'm saying your finishing um, technique, your knee pinch, your leg curl, your feel of. Is the shoulder too far away from your hips? Mm-hmm. I call it eating the burrito. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's thumb control, the understanding of wherever the thumbs pointed. Like I, I don't teach thumb to the ceiling. Mm-hmm. I, I, I never teach that. I, I talk about it. Why do people do teach it? And I get it. 
I don't teach it. Um, and understanding, keeping that pressure the whole time that you, and also that you don't have to have your legs in the perfect position to mm -hmm. apply arm bars. Uh, so your arm bar technique has to be phenomenal. <laughs> Pretty much. Your uh, finishing really technique. Yes. And you should yes. also, I'm going to, please. what do you think about, you know, being able to transition pretty nicely, let's say from S mount mm -hmm. to arm bar or some, some of the kind of the classic arm bar setups should mm -hmm. be pretty smooth. Yeah. Smooth is a better way to say that smooth, because yeah. I, I think the finishing techniques should be lethal. The transitions into it should be smooth. Mm hmm. So maybe not as sharp, sure. not not as efficient and and as good mm -hmm. as the finishing technique, but your transitions, at least a few, should be like pretty clean, pretty pretty smooth. That was a good way to put it. Before let me back yeah. up real quick. Something I forgot. Body control. Yeah, which kind of comes into the smooth part. It sure does. But in general, there shouldn't be a lot of uncontrolled Flopping. body weight going around yeah. with a purple belt because that's your your you've got a level of technique and you're if you still can't control your body weight you're a little yeah. dangerous yeah to your training partner so i want to so, see that absolutely um i'm sorry i didn't mean to no you're good uh and i'll be quicker on the other ones so triangle yep know how to do a triangle i'm not saying you have to have a lethal triangle for this is for me that's why i said the arm bar for me is that's a, that will be a staple for me um triangles know how to do it show quality technique not to say you're going to always be able to apply it in every scenario but show that you put boots on you have internal rotation on both knees you understand getting the shoulder out to make it even tighter arm across yada mm -hmm. yada um ability to finish a triangle without the arm across as well which shows that you have a good boots and Internal rotation. So what I'm hearing from you is, from for you, those finishing mechanics, whether it's arm bar yeah. or triangle, really got to be sharp. More than setups. and Yeah, and the injuries. finishing mechanics, yeah. sure. I, I, I really want to see those finishing mechanics. As a purple, but you're considered advanced. Yep. So I want, to me, that is the beginning of advance. Once you have the, the end piece there, all your entries come later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cross collar choke, mm -hmm. you need to have casting and all that kind of thing down i think whether it's cross collar generally your collar chokes the yes. mechanics are very similar just different I just orientation literally had someone ask me about that today after class they're the same and i said the exact same thing i was like any collar choke you're casting yep bow and arrow cross collar stuff you know, whatever we want to call it ezekiel's there's double lapel yes there's zipper yep. chokes yep they, these things mm -hmm. the principles are the same they are um so uh Collar chokes, boom. Um, basic understanding and ability to do Kimuras, Americanas. Yes. Uh, um, uh, paper cutters. Paper cutters, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and controlling your submissions. Yes, and which leads into, I personally would like them to know how to do a knee bar um, and a total. To get purple belt? Yeah. Know how to. I'm not saying yet that has to be like your best game. I want you to to be an advanced jujitsu practitioner. I think you should know how to do a knee bar and a toe hold and understand the breaking mechanics of them. Okay. Yeah. Your turn. Yeah. I don't know if that would be a requirement for me. It's something that my students would start working on mm -hmm. for at, sure at Purple at Belt. Purple. I think that's would be a, a big focus at that point um, for me. But I don't know if someone didn't really have those mechanics – at blue belt, I I think the only reason we don't say it at blue belt is because IBJJF doesn't I know. allow it, and I we I think we're both on the same page that not allowing a knee bar at blue belt is kind of dumb. Yeah, I I would rather see really sharp ankle lock variations, sure. some sharp ankle lock variations to me. I mean, I, I throw the ankle purple lock purple. in there as like you need to know how to finish it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, but sure, yeah, no, I. I, 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 but keep going. Keep no, going. I, I get it. Um, no, I, I want to see um, some type of uh, choke from the uh, pinning, all the pinning positions or so in the dominant top positions. Side chokes. Yep, yeah. top side uh, from the back, um, knee on belly. You know, you should have something in your game. You know, whether it's a bravo from you know mm -hmm. knee on belly or mm -hmm. um, 
a couple different options from the back. Um, some sneaky little things from side control, whether mm-hmm. it's the the scarf choke or whether it's um, a step over, maybe or uh, I mean, that's or it didn't even mention that the step over the Kanto choke. Some people yeah, call it yeah step over choke, head and arm choke. The 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 one I really like the you know the paper cutter from the north mm-hmm. that side mm-hmm. position. Anyway, you should have two or I think you should have two or three um, from the from the major positions. Um, I agree with you 100%. Those armbar mechanics, Kimura mechanics, Americana mechanics, the mechanics should be sharp. Yeah. Um, yeah. What if their mechanics aren't very sharp, but they can display the knowledge? So they're not applying them in roles too much. That's okay. But they can, like, you can see them, like, help if, a pair of white belts and yes. like they're saying the if right they stuff. can demonstrate the mm-hmm. levers yeah. the fulcrums the and some of the in the mechanics i'm yeah. fine with that for example carry might not do a closed guard arm bar where the hips slide out no. and like you kick around and it's right. like a whoosh, yeah. right but if she has two people there like me and olivia and like she sees olivia's doing something wrong she could walk over and like hey, Olivia, you gotta like you know the, know the mechanics. Yes, of it. yes. Yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent with okay. that. Yep, because it's exactly true. Yeah. Um. So now the last piece, um, yeah. defense, Oof. your escapes. So maybe the most important. It I know, and it's very neglected. Yes. Um. You know, we all we all this we see the folks in our gym, blue belt level that mm-hmm. are that are hard to get. Mm. That that have developed some good defense, and more importantly, your escape shouldn't be just survival. You should be looking to escape to attack. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's a underhook side control escape to put someone in a half guard in a sweeping position, you should look to be able to chain your escapes into something. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and that's, a, I don't expect you, I mean, we're all going to get caught. Yeah. Um, so. That's the beauty of the sport is you can feel like you did all the right things, but someone happened to have an answer and yeah. their technique was just sharper. And I, I would like to see, for instance, I'd like to see not only an example, um, need to elbow mount escape into single leg X threatening a ankle lock. Yeah. You know, that's just mm-hmm. an example. Mm-hmm. So instead of just escaping, yeah, which I would expect you to look at to become blue belt, mm. I want to see you turning that escape into some advantageous position or start, start or at least threatening it. That that's a good way to put it because yeah, to get your blue you may belt, not be able to yeah, you want to have the escape just to get out of a bad position. The mechanics, yeah. So I'm just trying to get half guard from mount something. I just want to get safe again. Yes, mm-hmm. but as you are getting to your purple. Mm-hmm. Let's actually turn that into something. Yep. Okay. I like that. Yep. Um, yeah. Just like I said with the arm bars, you, I want to see some very good hitchhiker um, defense for arm bars. Even spazzy ones, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you better like, be able to spaz you like out that? of every arm bar you've ever been put in. Are you okay, That's gonna by the way? That's going to be so mad right are you, now. Are you still, are you still upset spicy. by it? <laughs> Let's call me spaz. So, oh, no. Arm bar defense, I, I, I want you to have multiple options there and then multiple understandings of what we're doing. So what I mean by that is like understand what you're doing that makes the hitchhiker work. Understand what you're doing when there's one I show where um, if you're the person's on bottom and, and they arm bar you and we collapse their knees and you have to go knuckles to chest. If you do not go knuckles to chest, you are going to put yourself in a belly down arm bar that's going to break your shiza apart. You have to go knuckles to chest. Um, so understand that piece. Understand that splitting the legs in an arm bar is basically how you get out of belly down arm bars. Um, yep. And, and getting in between them. So a couple things there. Like I like it. Uh, triangle chokes. Understand which way to turn. When, when you're in a triangle choke, mm-hmm. right? Understand if you can't turn that way, that doesn't mean you're completely dead to rights. There are a couple escapes you can do that when, if the person cut the angle really well, like they did good on them, there's a couple things, last ditch effort kind of stuff. Well, and then you have people like Carrie who seem to like to 
past that triangle sure. the opposite way that people well, that, are that's traditionally what I mean, taught. Yeah, there, there's things. There are escapes, even though <clears throat> you can't turn the 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 correct correct yeah. way. There are other things that you can still do. So I, I would I want I want that to be um, there. I, I like it, and um, I want to see the the last thing I want to talk about. Mm-hmm. I want to see the very beginnings of a strategic thing where you're starting to think about setting people up mm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're thinking, and what I mean by that is you're, you're starting to, that goes against, again, to that kind of cerebral aspect of it. You're, you're either putting, you're baiting someone maybe yeah. to get, you're trying to get them to do something you want them to do. You want to start thinking that way. I'm yeah. not saying you got to have that all down. Cause that's something you're going to develop as a purple belt into yeah. brown belt. Yeah, it, starting to realize what Kazushi means and what mm-hmm. it does. I started doing that stupid Turkish get up from mm-hmm. bottom of side control by dangling my um, far right. arm, like, hey, here's a Kimura. And as right. soon as they reached over, that was my sure. thing. And I started doing that as a blue belt, just kind of how can I make them do something I want them mm-hmm. to do? Mm-hmm. Right. And just to start to think that way. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think from a concept standpoint, like that is. That should definitely, we should start seeing signs of it. Signs of it, yeah. Um, submission defense, ankle lock defense, putting your foot flat, putting weight on it. Okay. Huge. Um, uh, when someone, like, basically a lot of grip stuff for chokes, mm-hmm. like understanding which way to turn, to unravel so the choke. So important, yeah. Understanding if someone gets a cross collar, grip, pummeling your head. Mm-hmm. Um breaking grips i'd like to see people start addressing grips that is a great point and i skipped over it that is a really good point because i I see people not addressing grips right and it's literally the first fight in everything you look at a black belt match yeah it is a grip dominance Mm -hmm. thing it's it's fighting for those grips um keenan cornelius i brought it up before he went over Hamaloba Hall versus Leandro Lowe. And I think it was, I don't think it was the finals, but it was Mm -hmm. at Worlds. And Leandro plays this tarantula guard thing Mm -hmm. that's like spider kind of thing. And with with a same side collar grip. Mm -hmm. Hamalo is a knee cut guy. Well, they put put each other in in that position. And every time Leandro would grab his collar, he would break it. And Keenan started counting. He did it 14 times. It's amazing. In one sequence of yeah not the whole match just that sequence yeah broke the, the collar yeah starts getting his grips leander goes right back yeah breaks the collar leander goes right back breaks 14 times so that's the patience <laughs> of someone that's like nope yes. you're not going to get that on me exactly yeah and, and both of them leandro knows what he needs to make his what he's going for work homolo knew what he did not want him to do in order for him to be successful. Yeah. In other words, I don't want to see someone in, in someone's closed guard with a deep, um, <laughs> a deep, uh, cross collar, collar, cross collar. Grip. Yeah. And if That's, you are there and the guy's just outpowering you pummel the head, yeah, you got to address it or show that you understand he's not going to choke you with one arm. Correct. You control the other limb. Yep. So yeah, perfect. Can I just bring up a question, please? Okay, so I'm sure for a lot of people who are listening, if they're blue belts, this probably feels pretty overwhelming to hear all this stuff. <laughs> probably. It's a lot of information. That's right, it's a lot of stuff. Not over two to three years, though. So. People probably know more of this stuff than they maybe give yeah, themselves credit. Yeah, but this credit. is for people who are towards the... Yeah, they're you know, closer like, to five years, probably. No, but I'm saying as a blue belt. In other words, you've had time to work on this so as this a blue belt. Oh, you're saying two, three years would want to start belt, looking yeah. at at the beginning of blue belt because it's a lot it is a lot of stuff but what i'm what i mean is is there are also certain things that you guys talk about like certain defenses like mm-hmm. certain things like you specifically mentioned bill that i didn't learn until i was a two stripe purple belt mm-hmm. so not everything that you guys have kind of like listed are things that your instructor is necessarily well you have i taught. guess you're lucky that bill wasn't promoting you then huh <laughs> <laughs> the, so well you know what i'm saying like there, there's I certain know. things like that. i know and it's not the professor's fault. There's so much stuff that and information they have to go over that sometimes things are going to be missed. That's a good, so, that is a good reminder that this is our requirements. This but, was, but also should someone then be studying outside looking for speci- these I specific see what you're saying. things? I see. Because they may not get taught it in their class. Yes. 
And the t- to your point, you should have a self study okay. at Blue Belt. Absolutely. You should be self studying. Hundred percent. Yep. If you are just at jujitsu for, like I said, the camaraderie, the fellowship, the uh, workout, and just the martial art itself. Okay, that's you know what. You don't have to compete. If you don't have a desire to compete, don't compete. Don't get pressured into that. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a desire, if you have any sort of desire, I would say do it. If you have a personal goal to get better in a certain amount of time, self-study. Do more than the bare minimum. The reason I, I split that is because if getting acquiring a certain guard or skill in a certain time frame, like by the end of the year, I would really like to have a good butterfly guard. Yeah. Like this is in the next six months. Um doing the bare minimum, whatever your professor teaches, is not gonna get you there. No. Especially if you happen to land in the curriculum cycle or they don't even do butterfly well, guard. But it's impossible yeah. for a professor to do that. 100%. Yeah. So in medical school, they always said, you were responsible for your education. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're here. You're not here just to be a passive receiver. You know? Mm-hmm. That's all you smiling. Yeah, I don't mean it that way. <laughs> you need to be actively seeking knowledge. And it's something that you were like, hey, I'm not really, yeah. you know, I need to, that's, you got to do that outside studying. So uh, we'll wrap up here in a second. So, the, but yes, and, and to that, Liv, like you just said, because Andrew's pretty much my only professor, but I showed you stuff that you hadn't learned from Andrew. And that's some things that I, because I think I know what the stuff you're talking about is the escape stuff. I didn't learn that from Andrew either. Okay. So that doesn't, like, every professor is going to have, just like, look at the difference between us. I said knee bars. He, he he didn't. Yeah. Every professor is going to have certain things that they want to see and that they teach. And the thing is, I haven't, I just started teaching knee bars for the first time, right? Yeah. It's been almost two years I've been teaching and I haven't shown knee bars once. Yeah. So even though these are some of my things that I would want, I'm going to try to teach all these things in a, let's say a five year period, like I'm going to touch on them. Mm-hmm. But the practitioner will need to one seek out, ask your professor. So say, ask the professor what they look for. Yes, and then also do what you like. Yeah. So you know, like let's say you don't really care about knee bars, but your professor is like, yeah, I want you to know how to do a knee bar. Learn how to do a knee bar, and then just put that away. Put it in the back. You don't have to do it, yeah. but just get the understanding. Because you want to appease your instructor because for him to put his stamp on you with his name, he's going to want a certain knowledge level in a certain area. Yeah. So, and for that person, that's, that's, they find that important. Mm -hmm. Like Andrew finds knowing how to get into headquarters, not doing headquarters, knowing how to get into headquarters and then applying headquarters is very important to him because he feels like it's one of the best passing yeah. positions there are. So you will know well, how to do that. I, I love it. Yeah. That's a perfect example. Um, how long is this episode? It's long. Uh, hour and a half. Hour and a half. Yeah. You're if, not getting that nap. If people, I'm not getting a nap. If people made it this far, can you put like an emoji in the comments? I'm wondering if people listen this deep. What emoji? Uh, I don't know which one. A poop emoji, of course. Poop emoji. Oh, okay. Hello. If you oh, made it, if you even listen, go to YouTube and put a comment. I'm wondering if people actually listen. I think to it's the most deep. appropriate emoji, though, for this. Watch your tone. I do. Just because you got to lose B. Should that be next week for uh, Brown Belt? Maybe. But we're going to do it today. Poop okay. emojis, people. Put them in there. Hit the music, live. Thanks for the questions. See y'all. Later.